before we could put the real numbers on a rigorous basis, we first need to decide on an appropriate amount of rigor. For us, we'll assume it's in the Math Majors Basics playlist. That means we'll take his given knife set theory and the basic properties of the natural numbers. Now taking these as given, we're leaving out an interesting part of the story, the foundations of mathematics. For this part, we'll give a very loose and brief account of the foundations. Now where do we begin? We start with axioms. So if we have a theory of interest, axioms are the assumptions for the theory. That is, these are going to be the statements that we derive theorems from by applying the rules of logic. So, we have a collection of axioms, we apply the rules of logic, we have theorems, we keep repeating the process, and that gives a theory. We have a collection of axioms, two properties we would like them to have. First, consistency, meaning the axioms do not contradict one another. And independence, meaning our set of axioms as small as possible. So no axiom is actually a theorem for the remaining axioms. For example, for Euclid's elements, so we're doing plain geometry, turns out we need to take the parallel postulate on as an axiom. Okay, so that says if we have parallel lines in the plane, they do not intersect. So the parallel postulate can't be derived from the remaining axioms. If we leave out the parallel postulate, there are other geometries that fit the remaining axioms that are not plain geometry. Now, for us, we're interested in the axioms for everyday mathematics. So by everyday, I mean algebra, geometry, analysis, combinatorics, fields outside of formal logic. Typically, we use the ZFC axioms. So the ZF is for Zermel Frankel, the C is for axiom of choice. We're not going to go into details of ZFC here, but we will note some features. First, we note still an issue as to whether ZFC is consistent or not. Now that may seem troublesome since ZFC is the axiom set for everyday mathematics, but if there was an inconsistency in ZFC, that would be a huge result, but it's not likely to have much effect on everyday mathematics. Okay, mostly it's going to be about foundational issues. Of course, if you're doing everyday mathematics, okay, if you're not a logician, when you look through the ZFC axioms, it's hard to see what could possibly be offensive. Now, next, we have the axiom of choice. Okay, so traditionally, the axiom of choice has been a source of controversy, but not so much these days. Axiom of choice says, given a collection of non-empty sets, S sub alpha, okay, alpha is an arbitrary index, then there exists a function that assigns to each S sub alpha an element X alpha and S sub alpha. And this we call a choice function. Here's a familiar application of the axiom of choice. We have X and Y non-empty sets, and F is a map carrying X onto Y. Then there exists a G carrying Y to X, such that F composed with G is the identity map on Y. Note, First part is another way to define equivalence relation, so an onto map. And the second part, we're just guaranteeing we can pick representatives for each equivalence class. To have this in full generality, I need the axiom of choice. So let's see where the choice function comes in. For that, I need a collection of sets. So these are going to be subsets of x. For each y in the set y, we'll define s sub y to be the inverse image under f of the point set y. These are subsets of X, and they're not empty because F is an onto map. That means we can apply the axiom of choice. So there's going to be a choice function, meaning to each S of Y, I can assign an element inside of S of Y, okay, which will be an element of X. That's how I define G. So G is going to look at Y, go to S sub Y, and then apply the choice function. By the definition of S sub Y, we get the condition here. Now to get a feel for the axiom of choice, let's take a look at situations where we don't actually need it. If f is a bijection, then there's only one element in each s sub y, and the choice function is defined uniquely. We don't need the axiom of choice there. If y is finite, so we only need to make a finite number of choices, then we get our choice function from the other zf axioms. So we don't need the axiom of choice in this case. If y is infinite, but we have a selection rule, Okay, for instance, if there are special properties about our sets, 
then we can get around the axiom of choice. For instance, if I let x be equal to the natural numbers, okay, in the natural numbers, every non-empty subset has a least element, and I can use that to get a choice function. So in general, if I have y infinite, meaning we're gonna make an infinite number of choices, but no selection rule, we need to invoke the axiom of choice. So that says there exists a choice function, but we might not have a recipe for how it works. So we would say we have existence, but not constructive. Now that can be troublesome because that puts a black box in our work whenever we invoke the axiom of choice. So, for instance, with Russell's example, if I have an infinite pair of shoes, okay, well, in this case, I get a rule just by picking all left shoes. If I had an infinite number of pairs of socks, we're, we're assuming we can't tell left and right, okay, we can't make those choices because we have an infinite set, so we have to appeal to the axiom of choice. Now, you still might not be convinced that the axiom of choice is much of an assumption, but in the past it caused a bit of controversy based on the results it produced. One such result with the Bonnet-Tarski paradox. So this really isn't a paradox, but it's very counterintuitive. This says we take solid unit ball in R3, we could partition it isometrically into finitely many pieces, okay, so no distortion or stretching, take those pieces and reassemble them into two solid unit balls. So with the axiom of choice, I could double the volume of a solid unit ball. It's known that we could do this in five pieces, and this is something that's not in our everyday experience. So these pieces are not gonna have a volume as we know it. Okay, we call these non-measurable sets. And these days, we just take non-measurable sets as a feature of R3. Another consequence of the axiom of choice is the well-ordering theorem. The well-ordering theorem and the axiom of choice are equivalent in the ZF axioms. This says every non-empty set X may be well-ordered. And by a well-ordering, we mean a strict total ordering on X, such that every non-empty subset of X has a least element. The prototype for a well-ordering is the natural numbers with the usual less than. Now, features of a well-ordered set, there has to be a first element, so that'll be the least element for the entire set. And here, that's gonna be zero or one, depending on how we define the natural numbers. Every element has to have a unique successor, so for the natural number A, successor is A plus one. This is gonna be the least element of the set of all B, such that A is less than B. Finally, for the natural numbers, all elements have a unique predecessor except for zero. So our picture looks like this. We start at zero, we continually take successors until we sweep out all the natural numbers. Now, What's counterintuitive about the well-ordering theorem? Well, it says we could put a well-ordering on the real numbers. At first, this doesn't seem like a problem, but if we use the usual less than, that's not gonna be a well-ordering. If we take the subset given by the interval from zero to one, okay, not including the endpoints, with respect to less than, this set has no least element. We would want it to be zero, but it's not in the set. Now, the well-ordering theorem promises a well-ordering on the reals, but it gives no recipe for how to do it, and it's still not known how. If we wanted to attack this, what are we up against? So what things do we need? Our well-ordering has to have a first element, so it'll be the least element for the whole entire set. Every element has to have a unique successor, as before. If we wanted to compare elements, okay, I would say that A is less than B, if A is the least element of the pair AB. Then finally, okay, we're working with an uncountable set, we're gonna to need to have many elements with no predecessor. So for the simplest picture, where there are many elements without predecessors, we could take two copies of the natural numbers, okay, put the usual ordering on each piece, then I would say every element on the left is less than every element on the right. We note some useful alternative formulations of the axiom of choice. For instance, we have the Hausdorff Maximal Principle and Zorn's Lemma. We won't say what these are here, but we do note these are the formulations we typically use in algebra, analysis, and geometry. For instance, we use Zorn's Lemma when we show that an infinite dimensional vector space has a basis. 
final note on the axiom of choice. If we reject the axiom of choice, then we can still work with the natural numbers and the rational numbers. Okay, the operations here typically only depend on a finite number of choices, but we lose the real numbers. So to put the real numbers on a rigorous basis, we need the axiom of choice. Returning to the issue of constructive proofs, okay, so this business of saying that something can be done versus actually showing it. If we were constructivists, so if we only insisted on constructive proofs, then we would typically reject the law of the excluded middle. So that says either a proposition is true or its negation is true. That means there's no third way. Now, if we insisted on being constructivists, okay, we lose a powerful tool. That means we can't use proof by contradiction. Okay, so note, proof by contradiction, we get truth of a statement by getting a contradiction when we assume the negation. So we're not actually showing anything when we use proof by contradiction. Or we're not showing how to actually do something. We finish with a big question, but without a course in formal logic, we can only scratch the surface of the answer here. The question is, is it possible to put all of mathematics on a rigorous foundation? In other words, can we find a complete consistent set of axioms for all of mathematics? Now what would that mean? By a consistent set of axioms, okay, we want a set of axioms that do not contradict one another. And by complete, we would want that for any well-posed mathematical statement, we could show that it's true or false using only these axioms. Now, I put this in quotes because it's not the right type of question to be asking. Okay, the type of proofs that we do in algebra analysis and geometry, very different from the type of proofs we do in formal logic. And this is the kind of question that we would need formal logic to answer. So a better question is, Hilbert's second problem. Show that the piano axioms for the natural numbers are consistent. Okay, the piano axioms are pretty much the usual rules we use with natural numbers. Now, this is a formal system in which logicians can work in. The answer here is one of the more profound results of the 20th century, so Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Now, the piano axioms can be shown to be consistent using ZFC, but that's overkill. What we would really want is to know whether we can show the piano axioms are consistent using only the piano axioms themselves, so they're internally consistent. The answer is that we can't do this using only the piano axioms. So if I want to show the piano axioms are consistent, we need to take on other axioms, such as ZFC. Now, Gödel also says in any formal system with the piano axioms, there are going to exist true statements that are not provably true. So that's going to kill this question here about completeness. Okay, we always have to take on more axioms if we insist on being able to prove consistency.